It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him. There are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. Looking around though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done. But if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a 10-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, it looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost retches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now, and this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. That's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. 
Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams. Dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's, well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, but with his head injury, he can see the light starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy. Operating theater, there, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with a heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. 
If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. There seems to be a parallel between high sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives, with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1550, Dr. Wondertainment's Custom Pets.